Hello, my name is Justin Johnson and welcome to BFI at Home and to this very special event. Uh, the film Back to the Future was released in 1985, the brainchild of Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. Uh, it was an outstanding success critically and commercially, making use of the latest special effects from George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic. It had a pacey and original script by Gale and Zemeckis, a memorably heroic orchestral score by multi-award winning musical maestro Alan Silvestri, and perfect casting, uh, including perhaps the major breakthrough of the film, Michael J. Fox. The film went on to become 1985's highest grossing film in the world and went on to generate two film sequels, an animated TV series, theme park rides, comic books, video games, and now 36 years later, a huge scale theatrical musical production that you reunites to Mekis, Gale and Silvestri as they join forces with one of the greats of the music industry and two of the biggest names in theatre. Uh, I'm so delighted that joining me today we have a Tony Award winning director who's worked on Getting the Band Back Together, You're in Town, On the Town, Jerry Springer, The Opera and so much more, John Rando. Uh, we have the producer behind the worldwide theatrical phenomenon, Ghost the Musical, and he's worked on other shows, including Breakfast at Tiffany's, uh, Gone with the Wind, Billy Elliot, Colin Ingram. Uh, we have a multi-Grammy Award winning musical legend with over 150 million records under his belt. He's worked with Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, Aerosmith, Katy Perry, Alanis Morissette and many others, Glenn Ballard. We have one of cinema's most lauded composers, boasting works such as Forrest Gump, The Polar Express, Castaway, Predator, Avenger Infinity War, Avenger Endgame, The Lilo and Stitch, and with multiple Oscar and Golden Globe nominations, Alan Silvestri. And we have, of course, the writer and producer of Used Cars, the co-writer of Spielberg's 1941, the writer and producer of all three Back to the Future films, and custodian of all things Back to the Future, <laughs> Bob Gale. Uh, thank you and welcome to all of you. Happy um, to be thank here. you. Bob, I'm going to start off with you if you don't mind and actually just, just having a quick uh, chat about the film itself. I mean, it was clearly a huge labour of love for you back uh, in the 80s and despite having this kind of cracking script and a really original concept, it did take a while before the green light actually was given to start with the film, wasn't it? Yes, the first draft was... Uh, dated February 1981. The second draft was March or April 1981. Uh, and nobody, nobody wanted to make it. We had been commissioned by uh, Columbia Pictures to write this. They loved the idea. But by the time the script was finished, we kept hearing two things. Um, it's very nice. It's very sweet. We want raunchy. And time travel movies don't make any money, which happened to be a true statement at the time. So uh, Bob and I took the project away from Columbia. They gave it to us actually, because they want to get their money back. And we ran around town trying to set it up and uh, it was rejected over 40 times. And what finally got the movie going was uh, Bob Zemeckis went off and he made a hit movie called Romancing the Stone. And then everybody and their brother wanted to make Back to the Future and that uh, we got it set up with our friend Steven Spielberg, which was, I believe, the very first Amblin Entertainment uh, project, uh, certainly the first to be done out of their new offices at Universal, um, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And is it true that in one of the original uh, drafts, it was actually going to be a time-traveling refrigerator that Marty was going to be traveling in? That's correct. It was a time chamber made from an old refrigerator. And um, that was the way it was in the, in the first two drafts. Uh, and when we finally got uh, the green light to go into pre-production, um, Bob Zemeckis is putting on his director's hat and he's thinking to himself, he's thinking out loud. He says to me, you know, Bob, uh, having the logistics of, of moving this thing around on the back of a pickup truck is, is gonna be a pain. Uh, wouldn't Doc have been smart enough to have built this thing into a car? I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. And then he said the greatest thing, what if it was a DeLorean? Uh, John DeLorean happened to be on trial. This was August 1984. So we were seeing John DeLorean on the news. And we said, oh, man, that's cool. That will give the car a little bit of extra danger and notoriety. Uh, and that's how it came to be a DeLorean. 
and I'm not sure who's best um, positioned to answer this question, but at what point did this idea to create a stage show from the film become a, a reality? Well, it actually, uh, the impetus was uh, Bob Smex's wife, Leslie, and they had gone to New York and they'd seen the producers. And coming out of the theater, Leslie said to Bob, hey, did you ever think about turning Back to the Future into a, into a theatrical musical? And Bob said, well, that's interesting. I'll, I'll run that by Bob. And uh, they came back to California and Bob ran it by me. And I said, well, that's interesting. I'll have to think about that. And I think that seeing the movie version of the producer's musical was really instrumental in, uh, you know, making the lightning hit my head to say, okay, yeah, I see what we could do here. Uh, and then in early 2006, we really started um, brainstorming about it. And of course, um, the first two people we wanted to get involved were uh, Alan and Glenn. Uh, Glenn had, and Alan had collaborated on the songs in Polar Express. And uh, they, you know, their enthusiasm was, uh, was incredible. Uh, and and that's, that's how we got it started. And Alan, can you tell us a little bit about how it was for you? I mean, typically, unless you're um, perhaps adapting a, a score for a kind of a, a, an orchestral concert or something, you wouldn't necessarily revisit um, a, a, a work that you've made such a long time ago. Although I know that the theme continues to be as iconic today as it probably was back then. But um, can you just tell us a, li a little bit about that kind of journey of, of revisiting Back to the Future and then obviously working with Glenn to, uh, sort of to work further and develop the project? Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. Um, had a, a unique experience with the Bobs with Back to the Future in concert. And that was a situation that was going to require um, changing anything involving the original film. In this case, we were going to need some more music. And what was always amazing was how open the Bobs were to anything uh, that needed to happen in order to make this work. So Glenn and I rejoined um, and Glenn is, is the most amazing artist, storyteller, musician, collaborator imaginable. And we walked in and sat at a lunch, the four of us, two Bobs, Glenn and Al. And we talked about this and Bob and Bob said, well, you guys go write some stuff and let's see. And so Glenn and I went off and we wrote some stuff and we had another one of those lunches and we played them a couple of things. Um, and, you know, it was amazing. They basically belly laughed through everything we played. We kind of all looked around the table and went, this could work. And that's kind of where we started. And, um, you know, again, we never felt a kind of pressure of a timeline and, you know, cut to 13 years later or whatever it is. So, um, you know, we just kind of worked through uh, and solved problems uh, as they appeared. And it was, I, I would say, the most amazing collaborative uh, experience I've ever had. And uh, again, to, to work with Glenn, we continue on. It's been so many, so many years now. I mean, there's just nothing like it, so. And Glenn, if I could just ask you to chip in at that point as well. Well, with something like Back to the Future, <clears throat> for me, uh, the first thing I have to do is take the Hippocratic Oath, the first to do no harm. <laughs> because you're looking at something that is, is, is a mountain of accomplishment. And it, so you kind of have to tiptoe into it, but then you have to be willing to, to just go for it. And as I'll echo what Bob is saying, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale had, had enough trust in us to just say, look, uh, see, what, see what you can do with this material, you know? And, I mean, look, I've seen the movie about 500 times. Like I know every, I know every beat, every scene, every everything. And the first thing you learn is that you don't take the movie straight to the stage. It's, it's a, a very serpentine process. It's no straight line to the stage. So mostly it was uh, 
feeling the encouragement of the creators and of course working with with al silvestri first of all not only was back to the future an iconic movie the music is so iconic so on every level i, I was dealing with i was being dealt a full hand a full house in my hand and i had to make sure that we could win it so uh it's just been like a long but fun journey and i, I will echo what al said it's the most fun I've ever had collaborating with with geniuses. You know, all right? you don't get to do that very often. And as and as Glenn says, what you obviously didn't want to do and probably maybe couldn't even have done is just to replicate a film and put it on stage because actually that is if it's been done already, why would you want to do that? And I guess yeah. what has enabled you to do is is a you've also avoided that kind of jukebox musical approach. You've actually written you know sixteen new songs in here. I wonder, Bob, from your point of view as the person that's sort of custodian of the story, if you like, how has that allowed both the sort of the story and the characters to kind of breathe in this new version? Well, what was really important, and, and this, and as you just said, it was critical to not do a slavish adaptation of the movie because you wanted people to say, "Well, I, I missed that joke, or I missed that joke." Well, you miss a joke, go watch the movie. This is a different medium, and it was important to address the strengths of this medium. We do things in the show that you could never do in a movie. Uh, and there's things in the movie that you could never do on stage. I mean, you know, immediately we said, okay, we're not gonna be able to do the skateboard chase and we're not gonna be able to do the terrorist chase because that stuff just isn't gonna work on a stage. So the, uh, the dramatic challenge was, how do you find substitutes for these things that are gonna work uh, and have the same dramatic impact and uh, and then and then there was the other aspect, of course, the, the, the songs. And what was great about this is that uh, Al and Glenn were wearing their um, their songwriting hats, and they'd come up with a song. Um, and I, I'm, the one song in particular that uh, really was, is is wonderful and uh, resulted in a little bit of restructuring was uh, Doc Brown's song uh, for the Dreamers. I remember Glenn played the song for me and it just, it just blew me away. And I said, well, we got to have that song in the show. And it required uh, rejiggering some of the stuff in act two to make that work, but it was worth it um, because this is musical theater. It's not a movie. It's not a straight play. It's musical theater. And let's, let's show off musical theater in the best possible way. So I'm going to move on. Uh, if you don't mind now, sort of to Colin and John, um, from um, from the sort of the, the theatrical side of the of the, the sort of the challenge, if you like, um, I mean, Bob has just talked about the fact that there were some things that just could never make it from that sort of transition from the sort of um, screen to stage. But there are still some kind of quite major challenges um, from a theatrical point of view that I'm not inviting you to kind of give me spoilers, but just in terms of talking about perhaps how you had to address them. And I'm thinking in particular things like the DeLorean car, the time traveling, the clock tower, you know, there were some quite heavy duty uh, technical challenges that I imagine that come out of those moments. I guess I'll go first. Sure. <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, you know, when, uh, when Colin first approached me about this, uh, turning Back to the Future into the musical, um, one of the things that besides, you know, being, this, you know, loving the movie and this and chance to work with these incredible artists, but one of the things that was really important to me was that, you know, in a musical, you have to have a great mountain to climb in order to have a great story. You've got to have a great mountain to climb. And, and we do in that we have this, this uh, young kid who is trying to get, find himself and find his family. And he gets trapped in a, in a decade, you know, in the 50s. Uh, and then he has to find his way back home. It's a fabulous story. So I knew at that, you know, when Colin said, hey, what about this? I'm like, you know, this is a really good story to tell. And this is very stage worthy. So that, so that, the, but the most important thing was that we had to really embrace the musical. We had to make sure we had a really good musical. And one of the great things about Back to the Future becoming a musical is that much of it takes place in the 50s. So already we had this great sort of musical tradition of the 50s. And, you know, and so... We, you know, I guided and helped and tried to um, usher us into a 
classic 1950s musical, um, which was very, very uh, fun and wonderful to try to try to help build. Um, and we did that. We, we accomplished that in a great way. That allowed us once we had that, which was, which took us a, a couple of years to get. Then that allowed us to turn to the more uh, the, the more technical issues that would, we would face. So, but prior to that, I didn't even think about or work on how are we going to actually do all this. All I knew is that I had a mandate that that I had to have a DeLorean from from my from my producer, and um, so so a lot of that was just taken care of. Really, truly, make sure you have a really good musical person, <laughs> and then everything will follow. And um, so that that's how that's how we approached it. And then um, one of the things, um, you know, with the, the cars on stage are, are really tricky and they're very difficult. And this movie not only has the DeLorean, but if you think about the movie, it has a lot of other cars, a lot of other cars. And that uh, one of the mandates I said to my set, brilliant set and uh, team, um, Tim Hatley and his associate was that you know, one of the things we need to make sure of is that the only car, the actual, the only real car we have is a DeLorean. Everything else we're gonna, we're gonna do theatrically. Any other car that we need and for any other part of the story, we're gonna do it theatrically, strip it, pare it down to a car seat or whatever it is. But the DeLorean must be the, the real thing. So that's one of the ways we tackled, uh, tackled the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, John, I, I had to come up with the, um, the choice of who to direct the show and uh, and put together some some names and some interviews for for Bob Allen and Glenn and uh, you know the, the great thing that John had done in the past was he'd done a lot of new shows he'd done a lot of film to stage and he really really understands the structure of the musical you know he understands that when songs should be in their place and what scenes we can do and what the rules are of musical theatre and he did such a great job of explaining that to, to Bob and Glenn and Alan um, that they were, uh, you know, I'm speaking for them, but they were totally, you know, on board with him. And then, as he said, you know, a lot of his concentration has been on, on the book and the, because this is, you know, it's about this family that goes through this journey. I, of course, was, you know, thinking about all the effects and how they could be done and eager to get on with that side of things. I wanted to make sure it was, I think Bob, Alan and Glenn wanted to make sure this had a spectacle to it for sure. And, and we do have that, but I think John's right. The priority initially was getting the, getting the book right and getting the relationships and all these wonderful characters right. And that, that is the heart of the musical. It has these great special effects, but they all serve the book and they're not, they're not yeah. magic tricks that are just there for the sake of magic tricks. Yeah. Um, and that was that was the right order, I think. One of the things um, I think in the film is that there's this very much sort of the, the buddy movie between Doc and Marty, but it feels that for the stage show, although that's obviously clearly still there, there's a lot more now about the romance between George and Lorraine, that emerging romance, and there's more that you can explore that probably the film wouldn't have allowed you to. And I just wonder whether, Glenn and Alan, you can just tell us a little bit more about that process and actually kind of, sort of how, how the story changed for you when you started to approach the music. Well, I think all along the way, the most valuable thing for us was that we had Bob Gale to talk to about these characters. Because in the movie, you, you're seeing the characters, but what's behind that character is what we were trying to get to as songwriters. And Bob had an answer for every character. I mean, uh, he really knows them. He, it's like he, he, he is their father, you know? And so... <laughs> We did a deep dive into each one of the characters, like who who are they really? I mean, we see what they do, but as John Rando was saying, the songs reveal their inner life, what they really are, are about. And so we had long conversations with Bob Gale about who these who these people are. And throughout the whole process, you know, Bob has, has created such a deep sort of uh, uh, history for all of these characters. And so uh, the further you get into this musical, the more you know about it. And I think on every level, anybody who likes the movie Back to the Future is going to learn so much more about these characters. And anytime we wanted to, to understand somebody, we just talked to Bob Gale, <laughs> really. It started there. And, so Alan, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say to one of the interesting things 
um, that we learned from Bob Gale was, um, you're not gonna have a close up guys. There's not gonna be a way to do that on, on, a, on a stage in a musical. And so what we discovered was that a song in a sense could be a vehicle for us bringing what a close up brings in a very dramatic moment in a film, uh, the song could bring. And, and I think one of the interesting things um, was that like a close up, the song can allow time to stop and suspend. Um, so we do something uh, in the second act of the musical where in the middle of a very intense action packed sequence, we go to a, what is now our close up and we sing. And uh, I don't think Bob Gale or Bob Zemeckis would ever do this in cinema, <laughs> I mean, it, would, it would be the worst thing they could ever do. And all of a sudden, here we are, and you know, uh, you know, Mr. Randow is a culprit as well in, in trying this, this concept. And it's amazing how it works and how it doesn't interrupt the action and the narrative flow of the musical. And in fact, enhances it. I never would have dreamed it until, uh, and you'll know there is a pun in there when you see the musical, but never would have dreamed this could work. And yet on stage, as opposed to cinema, this just works magnificently. So many, many personal discoveries and creative discoveries working through the challenges. I think, I mean, I'm, it's about time to bring on a couple of other guests in a moment. But just before I do that, um, the the show had its sort of first um, start in, in Manchester. In, in terms of getting yourself ready for that big opening and having your moment, I mean, thank goodness you did have your big moment, but world events rather overtook you. And, and obviously the, the, all theatres were closed in the country very shortly after that. Um, and I, I just wonder whether that has resulted in any sort of further changes um, for the London production or whether you've just sort of put it on ice for a year? Well, it, I mean, it's no, been, a, it's, I mean, John, John could fill in, but I mean, it has been a huge challenge, obviously, the last year. And as you say, thank God, we got to the opening night because we were able to secure the Adelphi Theatre, which we're going to. And more importantly, we went through the whole process of, of technical rehearsals and loading in and going through the whole set. So it was literally um, four days after we, we did our official opening, but we had managed to run for two or three weeks and that allowed us to form the show together. So that that is a, a really, we're very, very grateful for that bit. And since then, you know, we we have been working on, on some, some tweaks and some improvements. And um, obviously the Adelphi is a slightly different size of theatre than, than the Manchester Opera House, it's, it's narrower. It's more intimate. I think it's going to feel even more immersive there. And uh, but the main thing is, I think we we really we were so prepared in this show. One of the things to to say that haven't been said is we spent years developing this. We've done workshops. We've we 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 had a prototype DeLorean in in a in a in a sound studio in London. We've tried that. We've done illusion workshops. We've done three or four different workshops and readings. We did a three three week lab. Uh, last summer. And all that really meant that when we got to the theatre, we had we'd worked out a lot of the problems before we got there. And, and thank goodness we did, because it was really worth it. I just want to add one tiny thing is this that, yeah, we, we have been in the year that we did Dark, you know, the one thing we didn't have was an 11, 12 week run where the, a show can really gel. And that's just life. But we, we did learn so much and so we're able to uh, you know like this on zoom have meetings and we've been meeting since we went down you know once a month or whatever it is and we go over things technically and and just subtle changes and you know to make it just a tighter better show but um, we what we had and what we had in Manchester was uh, quite phenomenal so we're, we're now going to meet um, four of the actors who 
uh, created these roles in Manchester and then had this sort of moment where they've had to kind of put their lives on, on hold for a year, certainly as far as Back to the Future is concerned. And I'm delighted that we have got uh, Cedric Neal, who plays Goldie Wilson and Marvin Berry. Uh, we have Rosanna Highland, who plays uh, Lorraine Baines, uh, or Lorraine Baines McFly, if you want a spoiler. <laughs> Uh, if those that haven't seen it, uh, Courtney May Briggs, who plays uh, Jennifer Parker, and Ollie Dobson, who plays Marty McFly. So a very warm welcome to the four of you. Um, so um, just to, to, to begin with, um, I mean, we've talked about the fact that obviously it's the film that's sort of set in 1985 and the, the characters moved to 1955, but you're having obviously to tell it to an audience in 2021. And I wonder how you and the, sort of the production have ensured that your roles feel contemporary. Who's going to kick us off with that? That, with that with that big one <laughs> <laughs> I'll go um I think it's always important to be aware of the society you know we sort of live in today um there's certain things you could say on stage you know 30 years ago that you couldn't say on stage today um and you want to connect with them you don't want to isolate the audience um for myself personally I feel like I could be considered a bold casting choice um and what I mean by that is that the brilliant Claudia Wells, who plays Jennifer Parker in the film, her and I really don't look anything alike. Um, I'm a completely different ethnicity as, to start with. And it was never an issue casting or with the creative team. And it's so wonderful to be working with people who are so inclusive and progressive um, and just casting people who they feel are right for the role rather than who looks right. Um, so I'm just very honored to be working with this team really. Anybody else I can to say, throw anything in? I'll say for myself, um, being a black American male, um, and this story is set in 1955 when black Americans were very marginalized, and it moves to 1985 when we were a little less marginalized, but still marginalized. And in 2021, we're still marginalized. <laughs> we're getting it a little better. So playing this character, um, um, representing um, the American dream, because I think Goldie Wilson is the truest example of the American dream. And if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Uh, um, that's a plug for the show. You hear that, Glenn? Um, I, I take um, pride in presenting this character to the world again through this musical. Yeah, and, um, I, and I guess even, you know, in 1985, the character of Goldie Wilson, actually to have a character with such an inspiring story, he goes on to become the mayor of the town. Uh, you know, uh, he's actually, for a big kind of blockbuster studio film, it's probably fairly unusual. Yeah, it was, it me, was uh, kind of, go ahead. Go back yeah, there. let me chime in a little bit because um, this is an element that uh, is, is different from the movie. In the movie, you only see Goldie Wilson in 1985 on a campaign poster. And so here we were thinking about what are we gonna do in the musical? And we knew that the audience just loved this character from the movie, even though he's in it only for a couple of minutes. And we thought, hey, let's, let's make, let's give him his story. Let's show this. So this was something that we learned from the popularity of the character, but also to say, okay, here we are uh, in the 21st century and we're looking back on the 80s uh, and, and how can we do this? And in the movie, uh, Goldie Wilson is running for re-election, um, but in the show, he's running for election for the very first time. And so uh, th there's a different uh, progression there uh, and it works incredibly well. And so that, that, that is something that, you know, from the writing standpoint, uh, I was aware of to say, okay, now I'm looking back at the 80s, which were, which are as distant as the 50s were when Bob Zemeckis and I made the movie. So we wanted to put some uh, some social commentary about the 80s in as well. Rosie, you look like you've got something else to Yeah, add. I'll chime in. I don't know if my microphone's working. Let yep, me Yeah, we can hear you very clearly. Oh, good. Uh, you know, I think for Lorraine, it's a really interesting one because almost every time you see her, whether it's the film or in the musical, she's breaking with convention. You know, she's she does a lot of rebellious stuff. <laughs> and uh, um, whether that's for better or for worse, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, asking a guy on a date in the 50s, that's like a really empowered thing to do, I think, uh, even if it is 
her own son. Um, but you know, she's she spends a lot of time resisting expectations, I, I think. And um, so there's always been something inherently kind of modern about her. Um, and in the musical, you know, I, I Bob and John and Glenn have all done really lovely things to kind of draw those contemporary qualities out of her even more. You know, there's so many moments now where you get to see her confidence and determination and her gumption really amplified. Um, and as far as my job is concerned, it's just, I've considered it my job to just try and take that and run with it. You know, it's credit to them for, for making that happen for Lorraine. Lee, anything you'd like to add to that? Doesn't matter if you don't. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I was going to say a lot of the a lot of the time what we managed to draw from our our version of the film on stage is that Marty ends up being a lot of the time the eyes of the audience, and so I've always felt that there was a thing during it that you always had to have them understand the journey that this underdog was going through, and the thing that John mentioned before about it's a kid having to find himself. It and his family quite literally all amongst getting lost in time and then he has to find his way back home but like legitimately when I when we looked at that and had to try and pick that apart it's quite a traditional thing for anyone who feels like they're being suppressed to go through and it's a really wonderful battle that he has to go through and try and find his way and plus like John said these years ago and I always repeat it the story is such gas that it just keeps you going and you you fight for Marty the entire time and I'm hoping that that is something that can ring with the younger audiences maybe in 2021, that you can accomplish, you can accomplish anything if you just put your mind to it. I know we're always saying it, but that catchphrase literally rings throughout every scene. And you've got this obviously incredibly, I mean, iconic role. I mean, we've used the word iconic quite a lot today, but actually I think, you know, it's an iconic role. It's Marty McFly. Everybody knows when you say who Marty McFly is, when you think about it. And I wonder whether, I know sometimes with actors, they're very happy to look at the sort of source material and they want to kind of go back and relook at it. But other times, actually, they want to kind of almost distance themselves from it because they don't want it to affect their performance. Did you go back and re-watch the film or even watch the film for the first time if you hadn't seen it? No, I, I've seen the film loads of times, um, <laughs> like so many times. And um one of the things that when I saw it come through, I was like, there's no way that this is getting put on stage. There's no way. And then it was like, oh my God, this thing is real. This thing is real. And when I realized that the team from the, sh the film were doing it, because up until now you see so many adaptations of films to stage and you're like, oh, who's involved? Because that's something that I always wanted to be a part of as an actor, seeing the people that I'm working with, especially. And when I saw these names and John's name, I was like, Oh, okay, this is, the, this is it. And uh, I should say Marty's an idol of mine. And the reason I wanted to do this in the first place is because I already had trusted in the idea that they were gonna hire some other people to do this job for them again. And that was enough for me. It took away from the pressure because I knew it was gonna be so much fun doing it with whoever was involved. The pressure wasn't really there, apart from when I put it on myself, you know, when I'm waiting on stage for my first entrance and I hear Alan and Glenn's music and it's like, oh, there are people out there watching now. That would be the only element of me going, oh, I'm thinking about it too much. You know, I had my faith in them from the start, so the pressure wasn't really there. Normally when you do the workshops initially, the readings and so on, you, you know, you hire people you know and you, you sort of go through a fairly quick audition process. And it's, it is amazing that from the very first reading, which we did years ago, it's our, 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 our Marty McFly, Roger, who plays Roger Bart, who plays Doc, Hugh Coles, who plays George, and, and, um, and you know, obviously Lorraine and, um, and Cedric plays Goldie. They're, they're all the same people that we had right from the beginning. That, that's never happened. I don't think that's ever happened in a musical before, but they were so right for it. And, um, you know, they just kept getting better and better. And so material just developed with them. It's, uh, it's a kind of unique thing for this show. Uh, um, Alan, having had this experience of, um, of, of Back to the Future and, and, and so forth, are there other of your films that you could imagine revisiting in the same way? Um, well, certainly <laughs> not without uh, Bob, Glenn and John. Uh, so if we can find a way to, to maybe, maybe as well. that. 
<laughs> Colin as well. Colin I'll as do, well. I'll do, we'll do end game the musical, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that will be about 36 years in development. <laughs> um, you know, there is, it is such a, a distance to travel from a film, certainly an iconic film, to what all of these people are now bringing to an audience on stage. Um, it, it's, it's, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that kind of math. Um, I, you know, it's, it takes so many dedicated, talented people. I, I can't imagine it. I mean, maybe, who knows, maybe something will happen. But back to the future too. That's as far as I can get, Bob. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's, that's some pressure on Bob to deliver back to the future too. <laughs> we, put the all the, <laughs> we put all the pressure on him all the time. He can take it. Look at him. He looks they can take it. Yes, they can. <laughs> is, is it right, Bob, that one time Sid Sheinberg was, was trying to twist your arm to change it to Spaceman from the planet Pluto rather than Absolutely. back to the future? True, true story. I mean, true story. He was the one guy at Universal who hated the title, just hated it. He did. It doesn't make any sense. Back to the Future. How can you go? How can you go back to the future? We got to come up with a different title. And everybody else in every department of the studio would just say, "It's Sid. It's it's a great title. It's a great title." And we just dismissed it until one day he actually sent us a memo, uh, and he said, "I've come up with the perfect title." Spaceman from Pluto, and here's some changes you can make in the script to reflect that. And uh, uh, Bob Zemeckis, uh, Spielberg, and I got this memo, and you know, Bob and I turned white. We walked into Stephen's office with this memo. He says, "Stephen, he's serious about changing the title. What are we going to do?" And Stephen thought a minute, and his decision. He earned every every dollar he made off off of all three movies by knowing what to do. He, he went to his secretary. He says, uh, uh, Gail, his name was, her name was Gail, uh, memo to Sid. Dear Sid, thank you for your most humorous memo of November 14th. We all got a big laugh out of it. Keep them coming. And <laughs> he knew that Sid would be too embarrassed to pretend like, to say that he really meant it. And that was the last we heard of it. Well, sadly, um, we are out of time. I just have to say that the show is going ahead. It's opening on the 20th of August. So um, I guess there are going to be some fairly intense rehearsals beginning very soon, not wanting to uh, remind you of that fact, uh, <laughs> those of you who are about to be uh, giving up a bit more of your lives. Um, oh, we welcome it. Oh, we welcome <laughs> it. We, 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 we want to get back to work. <laughs> we uh, all have withdrawal. It's I think we're all <laughs> desperate to get back in a theatre, uh, both to see movies and to see uh, shows again. I think uh, that's uh, a very welcome bit of news that uh, it's that soon. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being here and taking part in this uh, conversation. Uh, a big thank you to Cedric Neal, Rosanna Highland, Courtney May Briggs, uh, Ollie Dobson, John Rando, Colin Ingram, Glenn Ballard, Alan Silvestri, and Bob Gale. A very big thank you to all of you. Thank you very much and good luck with the production. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the future. <laughs>